very fortunate today to have Jeff with us. Um, it is going to be a, uh, a fast pace, an hour and a half. Uh, so please ask questions as you go along. And Jeff, it's all yours. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Good. Oh, come on. You've already had done this as you wake up. How are we doing today, folks? Great. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look to the person next to you, and I want you to say something nice about today. Smart. One nice thing. I like your lessons. <laughs> Very lovely today. <laughs> It is. Gracias. I'm sorry. Okay. You switch? It is so nice to see so many smiles. Now, I want you to talk to the person next to you and I want you to say one good thing about technology. Silence. Automatic silence. Go ahead. What's the first word that comes to your mind when you think of technology? Give it to the person next to you. What'd you say? Can't live without. I can't do Nice. Dependent. Well, let's see how we're doing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and I am an educator. I am a teacher in the North Brunswick Township School District, which is in New Jersey, just outside of New York by about 30 miles. And it's amazing that shift. Did you see that shift? Tell me something nice. Everybody lit up. Talk about technology. Pin drop. Crickets, right? So let's just figure out what we're doing today. What is the one word you used just now to describe technology? What did you use? Easy. Easy. How many people would agree with that? Depends on the day. Very, very good answer. Let me ask you this. How many of you guys used a word that was a noun? What word did you use, sir? Speed. How many people used a word that was a verb? What would you use? <laughs> Quick. Quick. Okay, what would you use? Helpful. Helpful. How about an adjective? Adjective. That's an adjective. <laughs> yes, what would you Spanish. use? Efficient. Was it? Efficient. Efficient. Yes. Fast. I asked in class once, and I said, what, what's your favorite word about technology? And he said, there it is. Like, it's a thing. So what we're hoping to do today is to try to change your conception of what technology is. What is 21st century learning? How many of you guys have ever heard that term, right? It's the buzzword of all buzzwords right now, 21st century learning. We're going to see if we can take this, play with it, face it, change it, and really move on for there. I got to tell you, we are living in an amazing time. And you guys have a great environment here to be an educator. Let me pull down my chalkboard for a second. Do you realize that right now, 2013, 75% of educators say that they're using mobile devices in their classroom? It could be an iPad, it could be a laptop, it could be an iPhone, iPod Touch. By a show of hands, how many people here are using some form of mobile devices? Some. How many are using them And if you look, there's a difference between this, and you're, you see this with your kids too. There's a difference between this, and this, and this, and that moves around. And that's okay. It's okay to do that. The point is, you're trying things, and we're all trying things right now. The neat part right now that we're living in is there's more acceptance of technology. Over 55, under 55, and I'm not going to ask which category you fill into. But why? Why is there more acceptance? Is it because it's, it's more available? Is it because it's cheaper? Is it because it's easier? Is it because we're getting older? And so we've just kind of been growing up with it? It could be all of the above, absolutely. But the confidence level of educators is growing. This is much higher than it used to be, which is better for your kids. Your kids are now being able to walk into what will be or what could be a completely digital environment. After all, you guys here have mobile devices. I see all the iPads, right? 
percent of educators are saying that they are trying to use an iPad in the classroom. For how many of you guys is that true? How many of you use an iPad in your classroom? How about as a teaching tool? You're actively up teaching with it, doing stuff with it. How many of you guys use it outside, like maybe you're at home, but you're using it for schoolwork? How many people are looking at it as a giant paperweight? <laughs> you're in the right spot. You're absolutely in the right spot. Now, social media. How many of you guys are using your iPad for social media? Twitter. Any Twitter? Anybody on Facebook? Anybody on LinkedIn? Anybody using it for video conferencing? It is amazing that 84% of educators now are using it for social media. They're using these devices to communicate with each other. Twitter is not about what did you have for breakfast. For some, that's what it's about. But look at how people are using social media right now. Most people today are on Twitter. How many of you guys, again, show of hands, are on, or let's say have a Twitter account? Look around. Now, how many of you guys are using Twitter in your classroom? So, we need to figure out how to use these devices, how to take the stuff that we already have and bring it into what we call a 21st century classroom. 109 teachers. Right now I have a survey going out on, on Twitter, and I have over 160 or so teachers that have taken the survey. I did it on a Google form, and 109 teachers have said that they're using Twitter, or they have a Twitter account and they're using it. 94 people said that they're using Facebook. How many of you guys have a Facebook account? How many are using that Facebook account for professional? Think about that. that. That's perfect. Now look, I have a Facebook account. It's where I keep in contact with my family. But I also have a Facebook page that I've created for my professional world. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go on today. LinkedIn, about 50% 50, 50 of people so far have said LinkedIn. What is LinkedIn? Professional network. It's Facebook for professionals, basically. You put your resume up there, and then you forget about it, right? Most people do. If you decide to really get into LinkedIn, it's an amazing professional tool where people are sharing resources constantly. Pinterest, anybody use Pinterest? Good. How about Tout? Has anybody ever heard of Tout? What is Tout? Tout is an amazing thing. It's free, 15-second video. 15 seconds of video. Imagine at the end of every class, you, a student, somebody in your class gets in front of their iPad and says, all right, today in class we have a homework assignment. It's chapter 15. Thanks so much. Boom. You save that 15-second video. You pop it on your class website. You pop it out on social media. You make sure that people know that you have that homework assignment. You use it for the good of your students. And that's tell. We'll talk a little bit about that later, too. And then... Uh, Now, iPads. We kind of did a, a quick survey here, but on, on a scale of 1 to 10, how many people would say there are 10, they know everything about their iPad? How many people are like in the 1 to 2 to 3s? All right, not bad. When I did my survey, I found that most people considered themselves between 6, 7, and 8, which is, I know where my iPad is, I know about some of the apps, but I really do want to figure out how to use it as a teaching tool, and that's priceless. That is amazing, and that's basically where we are. Now, it's this next statistic that's really been bothering me. And I want you to look at the statistic that I'm going to pull up here, and I want you to figure out what's so odd about it. The survey was done towards AP teachers, teachers that teach advanced placements. And the survey concluded that 92% of those teachers thought that the Internet had a major impact in the way that they were teaching. 92%. Is this good or bad? Ninety-two percent said the internet has a major impact in teaching. But here's my problem with this. And I looked at this and I looked at this and I said, well, 
what's up with the 8% that are living in 2013 that don't think that the internet is having a major impact on their teaching? How are you teaching kids to be AP level, ready for college, but you're not using technology? You're not using the resources out there that are free. How many of you guys like the word free? We're going to use that word a lot here. Okay. How many of you guys would download an app if I said, it's free, go download it right now, it's wonderful? You guys wouldn't? Now, for all you guys that had your hand up, what if it was 99 cents? Would that sway you? Depends. But more people would say, nah, I'd rather have it for free. Here's the idea that we want to keep in mind today. There is a quote out there. It's one of my favorite quotes. And the quote is, people don't want to buy a computer. They want to learn what they can do with it. Who do you think said that quote? Somebody over here? Absolutely. Steve Jobs, the whole mindset, they don't want to buy a computer. They want to learn how to do with it. They want to learn what they can do with it. They want to learn how they can be transformative with it. Well, we in, it, in education have the same exact thing. Nobody wants to come to here today or to go to any other professional development system and learn how to use a computer. We've all been to that. But we do want to figure out how to enrich our students' lives. We do want to figure out how to be transformative in our classroom. Teachers don't want to learn how to use a computer. They want to learn how they can inspire students. Anybody else want to agree with that one? Our job is to inspire. Now, maybe that's inspiring them to read the textbook. Maybe that's inspiring them to go out and create the next Apple. But it's our job, I feel, to inspire our students to do great things. And right now, we have a lot of different resources. And the resource that I see more often than not here is this guy. Absolutely. So the question here is, what is the iPad good for? Many people ask that question. What is it good for? What are we using it for? What do you use? What do you use your iPad for? I see it right there. You got a nice case, by the way. What do you use your iPad for, sir? Using what? What app, sir? I don't know. They, I don't know too much about the user, so that's why you know they do the homework and they can and they can say. You're using it to using it as a tool. What else? Give me give me something that you guys use your iPad for. Yes. Assessments. Assessments. How? Socratic. Nice. Socratic is a really nice app. You guys know what Socratic is? What is it? Um, well, it's we're going to talk about it later, but now you're putting me on the spot. Yeah. Um, it's when the kids get to sign into your classroom and you have questions, whether it's from a reading or a video that you just watched or just vocabulary. We're going to talk about a lot of these tools. And the best part about these tools is that most of the things we're going to talk about today are free. Now, look, there's a lot of things you can do with our iPad. You can take notes. You can use it as a dictation device. You can translate it. You can use it to create a family tree. You can play the piano on it. You can play the violin on it. You can share writing with it. You can take it out and have it give you a tour of the Philadelphia Zoo. You can have it used for basically anything that you want. It is an extension of your hand. It is an extension of yourself as a teacher in the classroom. There's a lot of things. First of all, there's a great reason to use the iPad. Number one, there's over 700,000 things that you can do with it. And there's more all the time. Over 300,000 of those 700,000 things are made specifically for the iPad. Higher resolution, more graphics, more stuff to do with it. Over 30,000 educational apps. There are so many reasons for educators to use the iPad, but is that the only resource that's out there? Of course not. Did anybody see the news yesterday about what happened in Maine in education? Now, if we had some more time and if we had a class, I would tell you, go Google what happened in Maine yesterday. But yesterday, Maine, Maine, by the way, is a one-to-one -one state. Everybody in Maine ha is a one-to-one -one school. And for the last four or five years, they were one-to-one iPad. Well, yesterday, Maine decided to make an announcement that they've dropped the contract with iPads with Apple, and they're now going Chromebooks. 
They're now going Google. They're now going Google Apps. The whole entire state of Washington, the state on the other side of the country, is all Google Apps. So there's a lot of great resources out there that can be used. There's actually right now more than 2,000 one-to-one programs right now in the country. That's amazing, and they're growing even stronger every day. I did a great podcast last night with Passaic City School Districts. Has anybody heard of Passaic City? They're about 10 miles outside of New York City. They are a 15,000 student urban district. They had no technology to three years ago, but their technology department is fantastic, and they actually, because 95% of their kids are on free or reduced lunches, they qualified for a $1.8 million grant, and now from grades seven through 12, they're implementing over 5,000 Samsung Chromebooks. They're using this technology. They're using all of this stuff as a tool. So um, it kind of brings up the question of what does a 21st century classroom look like? We've heard this term. We've heard this buzzword. What is a 21st century classroom? What do you think? I heard, I heard two answers using the same words. You said technology, technology and you said anywhere. anywhere. Well, that's good. Does this look like a 21st century classroom? Does this look like a classroom that could have been 1995? Maybe the, maybe the, the, the laptop's going to be a little bit bigger, right? But, <laughs> but this is a good example of students using $1,600 yellow legal pads. Right? They're not doing anything that, that, you know, they're not doing anything special. They're taking notes using their notebooks. You can do that with pad and pencil, right? Is this a 21st century class? No. No. Yeah, it looks cool. Yeah, that picture right there is probably worth about $20,000 or so. But is it really 21st century? Are they doing things? Here's what I love. Everybody has their laptop open and this kid's playing on his phone. Now is the 21st century school, school, right? So what does a 21st century classroom look like? Well, we use the word technology, right? We know that a 21st century classroom has to have technology. Does that mean that we have to use technology in our 21st century classroom? Not all the time. But we do realize that technology is vital. Technology is what's going to help us do those amazing lessons, transform our kids, get them excited about learning. We said the word mobile. Use it anywhere. Absolutely. Use it anywhere. And doesn't that mean inside the classroom too? Let's say if right now I said everybody stand up and move to another table. Everybody stand up and I want to have groups of five over there, groups of three over here. That is mobile. That is using the environment. I asked last period, what does your 21st century classroom look like? And they said, I want to start with the environment. There's a great... Um, article I saw the other day about what does a 21st century classroom look like, and they showed a picture, and this guy's got beanbag chairs in his room instead of desks. Kevin Jarrett. Beanbag chairs. The kids are coming in, and, and it's a STEM room, but they're, they're doing great stuff. They just don't have, they don't need desks. So it really isn't about that. We know that in order for to be a 21st century classroom, you have to connect. You have to communicate, you have to collaborate, but the most important C word is create. It has to be an environment where the kids, as well as the educators, are creating the content, not just passively. And then most importantly, and I think the biggest one is that it meets the needs of today's students. What are the needs of your students today? What are the needs of your students? We're, we're, we're all educators, we're all here in, in the high school. What are the needs of our educators? to be challenged. Differentiated learning. I love the buzzwords that are coming out already. Anybody else? Give me some more good buzzwords. 21st century, what does it mean? Yes. Computer literate. Good. Anything over this side? Yes. Oh, good buzzwords. Anybody else? Are we awake? Advanced. What does that mean? Advanced? Yes. So we have this idea of what a 21st century classroom looks like. We've all seen it. It looks exactly 
like this. This is the idea for what the future looks like, right? Now, let's figure this out. We have a computer in the room, right? The teacher is nowhere to be found. And if the students wanted to get around and move, what do they do? They hit the button on their little screen and their chairs just go. This is 21st century learning in the eyes of 1950s, right? Is it really 21st century learning? How about this? Let's just do a little compare and contrast, okay? Why don't we make a room where the students are facing each other? Why does the room have to be, as we call it, custodialable? Well, what do I mean by custodialable? Easy to clean. Easy to clean. <laughs> when you look at a room, and this is a good example here, but a custodian can take a broom and go right down, right? Why can't our classrooms be fit for the kids? not fit for the custodians? Why can't we create a learning environment where everybody can be interactive with each other, can see each other, can ask questions of each other? Yes, the chairs are more comfortable too, right? Much more comfortable. And yeah, they all have laptops and stuff like that, but it's not outside learning, right? It's not mobile learning. How long have we been talking about mobile learning, do you think? How many years, how many decades have we been talking about mobile learning? Here's mobile learning. Here's learning outside of the classroom, right? This is a way to teach a student, to show by example, to lead. But it's not really 21st century. This, however, is the same exact picture. Would this be considered more 21st century? You're using technology. Let's go down the checklist. You're mobile. You're collaborating. You're working together. You're creating. This is a great lesson. She's having a good time. She's wearing her Batman shirt. But if you look at any textbook, they're going to say a 21st century classroom happens to look like this. You see a digital projector. You see an interactive whiteboard. You see speakers, a student response system, everything that we've already talked about. But what does this require a school or a, or a classroom to have? What? People and... Someone's in charge and guiding. What else? The biggie. Money. Money. We don't have any of that, right? We want to be able to do things for zero as much as possible. We want to be able to make things available to our students. Well, then instead of having everything for a class, how about we have a media center? Why don't we put everything into one big room? Then we can add document cameras and, and, and all of it. Don't need it. Don't need it at all. So we're here today to reimagine what the 21st century classroom looks like, okay? So come with me on my journey. What does this classroom look like? What would you like to see? Well, let's figure out what we have now. How many people are teaching with their laptops? iPads? How many people are happy with the way that their classroom is set up right now? Good, awesome. A few people say perfect, which means that most of us want to change things a little. So the question is, well, what does our classroom look like? What do we want? Our, if we can imagine everything and still keep that zero free budget, what can we expect it to look like? So I'm going to show you guys a few things that we can do. And I'll give you some examples of how we can create a 21st century classroom for almost zero dollars. Now, let's go back to our definition. Is this a 21st century classroom, folks? Yeah. What do you notice about the picture? They're outside. They're outside. So we're mobile learning. They have what with them? IPads. iPads. So they have some kind of technology. They are interactive. They're working together. They're collaborative. They're probably doing some kind of content creation, right? This is just as good of a picture of a 21st century classroom as the one I showed you a few slides ago with the, with the desks in a circle. You can do this. Anybody can do this. How many times are your kids asking, can we go outside? And so I'm going to show you guys a few things today. Number one, I'm going to show you how to create a killer website. How many of you guys have a classroom website? How many of you guys don't know how to make a website? How many of you guys would make a website if you knew how easy it was? And it was free. There you go. See that? Notice, the hands went from here, and I said free, and then the hands went a little higher. Lots of good stuff back there. So we're going to talk about websites. We're going to talk about audio and video. How to create killer, imaginable content. 
and put it on your website to not only give your site meaning, but also give it resale value. And when I say resale value on websites, I meant having your kids come back to the website. Come back, wait a minute, learning outside of the class? Yes, how to make their kids come back to the website. We're gonna talk about how you can create some amazing content for free using some great free tools. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about how you can have your students create work to then share on those websites. So what I wanna first talk about is the container. Is that room? The digital room in this world is the website. Now, what is the purpose of a website? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. To communicate information. To bring information to students. I love that. That's always the first one I get. I love that answer. What else? The purpose of a website. Anybody else? To make things easily available. Awesome. Perfect answer. Yes. Advertising products, absolutely. Yes, it's a portal to go someplace. It's a, it's a medium to go someplace else. Now, what happens if I invite you into my house? I say, all right, why don't you come over here at three o'clock and you come into the classroom or my house and I talk to you for four hours and I don't ask you for any information, I don't ask you to talk, I don't let you do anything on it. Would you come back? It's kind of like passive, right? We call that 1.0. The information is going in one place. So I completely agree with all the answers. Yeah, it is a place to have information come out. But it's also a conversation. A website is a conversation. A website is a way for you to have two-way communication. So just as it's important for you as the teacher to put information out, it's also important for the students to be able to do what? to put in information, to create information for that website. It's a conversation, it's social. And so we use the term web 2.0. Have you ever heard of that term? Web 2.0, it's a conversation. It's not just a conversation between two people, it's a conversation between two programs. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Teachers always ask me what websites are out there? What's available? How do I create a free website? I always turn them into three things. I turn them into Kidblog, I turn them to WordPress, and I turn them into Weebly. Now here's what I'd like you guys to do throughout the rest of the presentation. Oh, I've been watching you guys. You have your devices in front of you, but I don't see you using them. I want you to use your devices. If I bring up a site or something and you wanna check it out, go for it. If you wanna write some notes, go for it. If you wanna to talk to somebody about what the color tie that I'm wearing, go for it. Do whatever you need to today. This is an active session. Use the devices that you have. If I demo something and you wanna try it, go for it. If I move on to the next topic and you're still on topic one, go for it. We have a lot of stuff to cover. And the first thing we're gonna to cover today is websites. Now the website of choice for me and for many people, including this school building, is WordPress. WordPress.com. Now there's two different forms of WordPress. WordPress.org is the other one. Don't worry about that. Just go to WordPress.com. And what you're going to find at WordPress.com is a free blog. Now, how many of you have heard the term blog before? What does the term blog mean? Weblog. Weblog. Good. What does that mean? Journal. journal. Yeah. And a journal is another form of the word starts with a D. Diary. And a diary is just, today I did, today I did, today I did. But with WordPress, it can be so much more. WordPress can be turned into a class blog, a student blog, a teacher blog. It can be turned into a wiki. It can be turned into an e-portfolio, a news publication. WordPress can be turned into anything that you can imagine. So how do you figure out what to do? Where do you start? That's always the big question. How do I find these examples? And I think if we just kind of figure out what it looks like, you'll realize that WordPress is not amazing, but my favorite word here, it's free. So I want to show you guys some examples of WordPress. So that way you can kind of get an idea for what WordPress looks like. Now, this here is an example of, there you go. This is my classroom website, NBTHS Music. It's all done on WordPress. 
I'm going to walk you through that one in a little bit. In correlation with this, I also have a video website that I created. And this is all YouTube videos of, of other people's videos that they're all violin lessons. I collaborated with them. I put them on a site. This here is a website for Georgetown University's nursing department. Again, all of these have something in common. They have a sidebar. They have a header. They have a menu. They have a picture. And then in the middle, they have a spot for news or a blog or homework or you name it. They all start to look the same if you know what you're looking for. This is the one for EdCamp. And if you notice between that one and this one here, it looks the same. And these are easy. You, you, I'm going to show you how to make one of these in, in no time. This one here is reading text, it's reading RSS. And again, sidebar, menu, header, pictures, they're all the same format. And it's not just for education. You can see here that even the professional websites out there, they're using WordPress. It's that simple. You can have multiple authors. You can have multiple people writing it. So instead of making your own class website, I challenge your department. Make a website for your science department, for your English department, for your math department. And here's some of the ones that I made up for TeacherCast. This is all WordPress. These are all doing slightly different things. I turned WordPress into a Pinterest site, so I can collect links visually. This is a site that I do for app reviews. Again, header, sidebar, content. I decided to start my own social network. So this is a social site where people can sign up for membership. This is called TeacherCast University. This is where I'm doing online courses and stuff, but again, all the same idea. This is the Teacher Cast magazine, multiple writers, but the same idea. The best part about all of these different examples is that it all starts from here. It all starts with a white screen. Anybody can look at this white screen and come up with what it is. We have a header, we have a menu, we have a sidebar, and we have our diary, our blog, our journal. How many different segments was that? Keep track of. Four, four simple things. And what I'd like to do right now is to demonstrate just how easy this is to create a simple WordPress site. Would you like to see how easy this is? Now while I'm doing this, if you want to go through with me, I'm going to go through it pretty fast. But if you want to go through and, 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 and maybe try a WordPress.com site, that's completely amazing. So we have here our brand new WordPress site. So we have here our WordPress site, okay? Again, header, sidebar, blogs, menus, the whole thing. What's the first thing anybody wants to do when they create a website? They want to put a, a nice face on it, a nice theme on it. You don't have to be a graphic artist. A WordPress website has two parts. It has a front and it has a, oh, you guys have to wake up. It has a front and it has a, there you go. The louder you are, the better lunch will taste. Okay? So this is the front. The back is all based off of just, just menus. Okay. So right here, we have our menus. We can talk about posts. We can put pictures up here. We can talk about different plugins, all these different things. But I just want to focus right now on what it looks like. I'm going to go to the Appearance tab because I'm worried about what does the front look like. And as you can see, I've got a whole bunch of themes. Now, WordPress.com has you has you access to thousands of free themes. You can make your website look like whatever you want, and you can search based off of whatever criteria you have. Now, I found a theme earlier. It's called Academia. It looks like a really nice theme. And you can see here that it's kind of colored nicely. It's clean. It's got a big picture here. It's got a menu. So let's let's activate this. One button, automatically now we have our theme. So with WordPress, you do a lot of front end, back end, front end, back end. So I'm going to refresh this. And we have a blank theme.
theme. Now, what do you notice automatically that's missing from the front of the theme? The picture. So we want to have a custom picture. So how do we do that? We're going to come back here, and we're going to go to header. And we can change this preview to say something different. <coughs> but what we want to do is we want to find an image that's going to work. And I have an image here already set up. And we want our school planner picture. I'm going to hit upload on this. And I can make this graphic. I can find the graphic online, whatever I want. But there's a nice picture of a school. I'm going to publish the picture. I'm going to save changes. And when I hit refresh, I have a nice little website. Simple and easy to do. So what do you put on it? Next thing is like, well, i got to put some content on here. Well, right now, we have our heading. We have our menu. We can search through it. And then right here, we have our first blog post. Now, blog post could be anything. Blog post could be a picture. Blog post can be a homework assignment. Blog post can be a movie. Blog post could be a video. Anything that you want. I use it every day after class. I schedule my homework. And every day after class, I post out a blog post. And the blog post is, okay, today we're going to read page 15. Tomorrow we're going to read page whatever. Okay. Show you something here real quick. Here's my schools, or my classroom website. Again, done on WordPress. And you can see it's all similar. We have our heading, we have our menu, we have our pictures. Now down here, I have some announcements. Okay, Our orchestra took a trip, and so we took a picture, and I popped that out. Our orchestra played over at Barnes & Nobles, so we popped that out. Over here, I have our Twitter. I have a class Twitter account. Now, I don't use Twitter as a one to two way thing, but every time we have homework, I put it on Twitter. It's easier for me to put a tweet out saying go to chapter 13 than it is to update a website. But by putting a tweet out, it automatically shows up on the website. So I keep this thing interactive. I have some suggestions of other websites. Now, right here, I have a subscribe box. And the first day of school, I have all of my kids put their email address in there and subscribe to the blog. When we have back to school night and the parents come in and talk to me at parent-teacher conference, I invite them to subscribe to my blog. When they subscribe, anything that comes through here, they get an email. Now, why would I want to do something like that? Why would I want my kids to subscribe to the blog? Excuse me, to the blog. Why would I want this? Brings them back to the page. Brings them back to the page. More importantly, what? Yes. Yes, it sends them back to the page. They automatically get the post of what it is. But most importantly, who gets the information? Not the kid. The yeah. So that way when the parent calls and says, why is my kid getting a whatever, I can go, well, aren't you on the list? Don't you know what the kid's doing? It's complete transparency. And this is very, very simple. We call it a plugin, and that really means that the website can have any kind of thing that you want. These are all plugins. These are all free. You can easily set this web page up to look like that, and you can have them show up on your sidebar. Very, very simple. WordPress.com is a free resource. It's a free website. If you're not sure about putting one together as an individual teacher, let's say you have two teachers teaching biology, put together a science department website. Lots of great things here can happen. Show you my music theory course. do cartoons because, again, it gets people to come back. Every couple weeks I change the cartoons on them. Now, here are some homework assignments. Hey, we have some information on our quarterly tests. Okay. Here is a Google presentation on minor modes. Here is something. We did an assignment on the board where they were writing a whole bunch of stuff, and I asked them to get into groups and to make a group and the whole deal. And instead of copying it down, I took a picture of it and I put it up on our blog. And I also use a system here called Remind 101. Any of you guys ever heard of Remind 101? What's Remind 101? Um, I have a question and then you can answer. Yeah. Remind
9101 is a free service to communicate one way with your students. You put a free account up, you have your students subscribe to that account, and I have my parents do this too. So if you go to that phone number and you, you text the message with the number at ND, appearing at V, you can subscribe to my Remind 101 channel. When I have a homework assignment, a quiz, a concert, anything like that, I put out a text message, it hits their phone. And I can schedule that. So at three o'clock today, I'm gonna I have a text message that's already set up to say, kids, thank you for being wonderful today. I'll see you on Monday. They can't write me back. There's a there's a wall there. They cannot, so you're not interacting. You're acting. You're not interacting. Okay? But it's free. This service runs over 700,000 text messages a day. Teachers are using it all over the place. And because my parents are signed up for my service, now my parents are getting all the updates. And what parent has ever said to you, you're giving me way too much information about my child's education? <laughs> I've never once heard that from a parent. So these are different ways that you can use your class website to put content on it. And we're gonna continue to talk about that. So that's in overall essence, that is what WordPress is. I would strongly recommend anybody giving it a shot this weekend. And that is WordPress. Now let's talk about what to put on it. Okay, you have your shell, right? You go out, you find a nice theme, you make a website, now we're looking at our uh, at our content. And how many of you guys have experience working with audio or video? A little bit here, a little bit there. How many of you guys would work with audio and video? You knew more about it. Simple stuff, right? Good, thank you. Well, let's look at audio. Audio does have some amazing things for kids. First of all, it improves their language skills. It gets them talking. If you gave a kid an audio recorder, which they already have, because it's built into their iPhone, iPod touch, you can then teach them how to do interviews. I taught a summer course a few years ago where I had fifth graders running around our building and they interviewed principals. Now, these are fifth graders. And they were on the same exact level with those principals, asking questions. They were asking some amazing questions. But it helps their language skills. Not only that, but it improves their communication skills. You give somebody who doesn't want to talk in class or doesn't want to raise their hand a, pod, a, a podcasting device, like an audio recorder or something, it's transformative. That kid will start to talk. That kid will start to move. And it's pretty, pretty cool. It breaks down walls. So what devices do we use? What apps do we use? What do I suggest? There's a lot of free ones. There's, a re there's an app called Call Recorder or Voice Recorder on your native iPhone, iPad. It's free, but for a dollar. I recommend an app called Dropbox, D-O-X, Dropbox. And it's an audio recorder, but not just an audio recorder. It syncs your audio device with your Dropbox account. How many of you guys use Dropbox? A few. Dropbox is a, a cloud-based hard drive storage system. I have one for myself, and I also have one for my class. Now, why do I have one for my class? Because I have to give my kids the access to put stuff in there. If I have 30 kids in my classroom and they all are using this app here, they can then create recordings, they can record themselves, they can go into a violin practice room and do things. They can record simple podcasts. When they're done, all of that audio content gets synced up with the class's Dropbox account, wirelessly. You don't have to do anything. You're sitting there at your desk with your computer and suddenly all of these files come in. Then what do you do with the files? You listen to them, you can assess them, but more powerfully, you can upload them to your website. You can have everybody else listen to them. You can have mom and dad and grandma listen to them. <coughs> and so they're creating, I'll use the term in quotes, podcasts, audio recordings. And there's a lot of different ways to use those. Bless you. So now let's look at the other spectrum here, which is video. Video must be difficult. No, it's not really. If you have a Mac, which many of you guys do, you have GarageBand. And you also have iMovie. These are two apps we're going to talk about right now. And they're free. They're part of the Mac software. Okay, they're called iLife apps. But they're part of the Mac software. With iMovie, you can record high-definition video. That's what we're doing right now. 
or recording the video. Not only can then you record it, but you can simply edit it. And the most important thing, that last C, you can publish it. That, that creation tool. You can create the stuff and collaborate on it. And all you really need is any kind of Apple device. Now, can you do this on a Windows side, on a PC side? Sure. But it's so much easier to do it with your iPads. iMovie is free on your Mac. It's 10 bucks on your iPad. But because it's universal, it'll work iPad, iPhone, all this stuff. But it's an amazing app. What's the one thing that you need for using iMovie that everybody here has? An imagination. Come up with different ways to do things, and your kids will completely transform their worlds. iMovie is so simple and hands-on easy to use, and yet it's one of the most powerful video editing tools out there. Yes, you can take video, and you can stack video, and you can play with the audio levels, and you can add transitions, and you can add lower thirds, all of that stuff is great, and I'll show you some examples of how I'm using this in the classroom. But, in addition to this, you can also create movie trailers. Hollywood level, full blown, high quality movie trailers. Simple. And I'll show you how to make your kids do that. First of all, in my movie, they give you this little template. There's a few video screens up here, and there's text. And through that, you just simply put your video in. And then when you're done with your trailer, it gives you this nice little screen, and it's the best minute and a half kind of content that you've created. Now, I want to show you guys some examples here. The first example is of one of my students and a project that we did. In February, we celebrated Digital Learning Day. And we tried to come up with a way for the orchestra kids to contribute to Digital Learning Day. You know, we're not a regular classroom. We don't have whiteboards. We don't have all this different technology. So what can my orchestra kids do to contribute to Digital Learning Day? Well, we came up with this concept of wouldn't it be neat to make a video and use it as a teaching method. Use it to teach the younger kids in the lower grades how to play the violin. And so through the iPad and iMovie, we took literally five minutes to put this little video together of how do you draw a treble clef. And so this is my student, Meg, and we made about 20 of these. And within 10 minutes, we had it conceptualized, we had it up on YouTube, and we had a great time with it. So I'm gonna play this video for you, and I want you to kind of get some ideas of what are some of the things you can do with just a few students and some imagination. Lower third is a template, it does it for you. The background music is a template, it does it for you. All I did was put the video inside of it. can you use this as a tool in your classroom? Now we took that, we put that up on YouTube, we sent it down to the elementary schools, but not only the elementary schools in our district, people all over the world can now watch this. I didn't use her last name, right? Like we, we went through all those channels and stuff like that. But now she's creating content for other people. And it gives her a sense of ownership over the program, excuse me, and also of the learning. She happened to have a sister in the younger grades. It was great because that sister can say, look, this is my big sister, look at me on video. But let's look at, take, take a look at these trailers that I talked to you about. The nice part about the trailers is you don't need audio. You can just take any random B-roll footage and you can put together an amazing trailer. Every single December, we invite the elementary kids to come in and we have a thousand kids at a time doing a, basically it's a recruiting concert. The high school orchestra, band and choir get together, we put on a concert. And we said, well, what if we just started taking video? 
So here's an example of an iMovie trailer that was completely done by template based and took us about 10 minutes to put together. Hope you enjoy. <laughs> Imagine every department making one of these and using it as a demo for incoming freshmen who are looking for course selection. Pretty interesting. Imagine putting this in your course guide or your teacher comes up with one of these for algebra class. Make algebra fun, right? Or what other ways can we use these for? What other ways can we use them a, a trailer like this for? I'll tell you how we use it. When the chorus is done and the band chairs are coming in, we throw down the movie screen. We got a bunch of these things playing. Not just the trailers, but movies that we've made throughout the years with the kids. And now the kids know that we're doing that, so the kids even start making their own iMovie stuff. So instead of the parents going out and leaving, or you know, we basically tell the parents sit in the seats. We're going to entertain you. So while the chairs are being moved and all the noise is happening, we fill the audio, we fill the auditorium with sound, and we play. Movies and the neat part about it is it's, it's it's your kids up there, so it's a very very entertaining way to do things. Imagine doing this at graduation, having a bunch of people make up these little things about their graduation. Let me show you how easy this is to make up. I'm gonna pull up my iMovie app here. Oops. And I'm gonna hit new trailer. And now iMovie gives you a list of. Oh, 10 to 15 or so things. And let's just hit this one. They give you a preview. Now again, all the words you can change, all the video, you just drop in. You don't have to have to, you don't even have to worry about the sound or the words or anything that's happening. So, all right, I like this one here. I'm going to create it. And I have an outline and a storyboard. And on the outline, I can say, who are my cast members? Who are the people appearing in this? I usually recommend to do this after you put your videos in. If you look down here at storyboard, there are a bunch of blanks. So I'm going to take this here, and I'm going to embed this. And I'm going to insert this here. Insert this one here. And again, you can just see it's so simple and so quick and easy. And so when I want to play this, it's just that simple. Do this for a field trip, do this for a football game, do this for a graduation ceremony. Very, very simple and easy to use. Universal, any school can use it, any subject area can use it. So lots of great things there. And that's iMovie, a very, very universal app. And really when we're looking at using audio and video, it really is not about should we, it's about why aren't we. You know, as Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. Make some content that's memorable, make some content that's meaningful. 
I bet that if we as educators made content like this, what would the students tend to want to do? Right? We made up three or four of those little iMovie trailers, and then the next thing you know, the kids came up with these really, really cool how to be a drum major. And they went out and they got a bunch of their friends and they did drum major Olympics where the guy was pushing a car and throwing a football and conducting for hours on end. Like, they really came up with a couple things. So to reward them, we played it at the concert. It was funny. It was hysterical. You've got to be able to give your kids a reason to do these things. You have to give your kids a place to show off their work. And you have a website now. You have audio creation. You have video creation. You're giving kids a reason to come back to your website. Now, there's a lot of other things that we can do to add content. One of those is through screencasting. One of those is through podcasting. Now, podcast is a generic term, and screencasting is a generic term. What, what is screencasting, essentially? What do you... Have you heard that term? What is screencasting? Absolutely. And when I think of screencasting, and I might be dating myself, but I think of John Madden. Right? He's got the teleprompter, he's got all these things going on here. You're taking a, a video of your screen, and you're doing a, a demonstration. It could be a homework assignment. For instance, I could give you a screencast of how to make a WordPress site. And you can watch it, you can follow along with it, you can play it, you can pause it. Lots of different things. We'll go into that. Podcasting is also there. You can create an audio podcast of yourself talking about um, some biology topic. Or you can get, again, your whole department together and make a biology podcast. Textbooks. We're going to talk a little bit about how to create a textbook. Now, I, I understand you guys use digital textbooks a lot here. Somewhere in there. If you have a Mac, you have a free content creation tool to create ebooks. And I'll show you how that works too. Okay. And then finally, online courses. Wouldn't it be cool to create a course online or take your syllabus, take your curriculum and create screencasts that follow a chapter, follow a unit, follow, maybe you use six different pieces of software in your course. You create screencasts for all of them and your kids are now asked to watch that stuff or the parents as well. So let's first take a look at screencasting. Number one, it's personalized learning. You create that, not somebody else. Now look, I'll be honest. If you go to YouTube and you type in WordPress, you're going to find thousands of people that do a WordPress website and how to do it. And they're great. They really are. But I'm going to create one for myself for my students. And the neat part about it is it's my language. It's my words. If I don't want to hit a topic, I don't have to hit a topic. I can then go back and use that constantly. So it's personalized learning. It's distributed through your blogs. You can take that video, pop it up on YouTube, and then put it on your website. Okay? Good example here. Getting an increase on this guy. I'll bring this up in a second. So it's personalized learning. You put it on your blogs and wikis. You can use it to provide feedback, which is really, really nice. Um, a lot of times if my kids are making something, instead of writing back down comments, I'll actually take a screencast of myself on video and then just give them the video and say, here. Yes, ma'am. Is this a similar to a recreation? Similar. Right? Yeah, same ideas. Okay. They're just taking that and then going in a completely different, or similar, but completely different angle. And there's a lot of free programs to do screencasting with. There's one called Jing, J-I-N-G. It's free screencasting. If you have a Mac, which most of you guys do, and you have QuickTime, you can do screencasting on QuickTime. I've even seen people do screencasting on Safari, but I, I wouldn't go that far. But basically, you're the one creating the lesson. The example that I love is in music class, we use this program called Finale. It's notation-based. Instead of spending an entire day every year teaching the kids how to do that program, I just say, use the screencast I made two years ago. Here's the link. I even go back onto my blog and I pop the blog post up. I just reinvent the video and that way it's here. Go watch this video tonight. For the most part, the kids don't. But it's there. If they need to go back and reference it, it's absolutely there. Now you can see here on our Tech Educator website, 
we've taken a video, we've made up, we've embedded it on the side, it works. The kids can come here, they can watch the video and, and have that. The first week of school, I have a screencast of myself going, hey, welcome. And I actually walk them through the class website. So on the website is a video of me walking you through the website. Why? Because I don't know, I don't have to take that time out of my day in class and show them that stuff. And the parents can see it too. Most screencasting software is very, very simple. You have audio tracks, you have video tracks. It doesn't have to be complicated, and it's up here. So screencasting is very, very easy. The ones that are free are even simpler. You hit record, you hit stop, it gives you a video. Some of the ones that you pay for give you these extra little features to it, but you can easily screencast for free. Podcasting is another amazing tool. How many of you guys have used podcasts, listened to podcasts? What do you do, ma'am? Podcasting is amazing. I, I've been podcasting now for three years. But all you really need to do to podcast is just speak into this. The app is already there. Your voice recorder app is there. Now, if you want to use a podcast, that's great. If you're on iTunes, you have access to over 500,000 podcasts. And I'll tell you, 200 of them are amazing. Because I do them. So, but this is a very transformative tool to use. There are podcasts out there on all nine, Be Be excuse me, Beethoven symphonies. And they're great. So I use them every year. I downloaded them. I've I, I edited them out a little bit to make them shorter for my kids. But I use them every single year. You don't have to necessarily make the content, but you need to make the content available to the kids. Because I know the kids aren't going to be out there searching through iTunes to find that podcast. But every podcast on iTunes has a link. So you can easily link to it on your website. The app that I use for podcasting is called GarageBand. It's free. It's already on your device. And you can easily edit out yourself, your voice, any of that stuff. One of the things that I would challenge you guys for, when I, a buddy of mine asked me to record his wedding, I took this, I put it in his jacket pocket, and I hit the record button. This was my microphone, this was my, you know, so at the end, I, she gave me my phone back and I had the whole recording. Two hours long. Why can't you do this with your science labs? Every day, why can't you record <coughs> yourself and then pop it up on your website? It's so easy to do this stuff. And by the way, what's that word again? It is, it is absolutely free. So to create this kind of content for your kids is great and free. Textbooks, creating your own textbooks is awesome. Last year, Apple did an event in January and announced a program called iBook Author. It's free. If you have content, you can create an iBook Author program. And it looks like this. You start off with a template, and there's free templates all over the place. Okay, so you pick up your template. You can easily drag and drop any pictures, any content, anything that you want goes in here, your movies, your videos. Easily see that it looks like Pages, Word, Keynote. It looks like one of those programs. So to pick it up and to be able to figure out how this works is very, very easy. Charts, graphs. Now, if you want these pictures to blow up, you can have them blow up full screen. You can interact with them. You can put movies. Lots of different things. At the end, you've got a couple options. You can export that to a PDF file. As I say, your kids don't have iPads. But if they do have iPads, you can connect it into your computer. You can upload them to iBooks. Okay? and you create your own digital textbook. Why not make a digital textbook of your course guide? Why not guidance department people have a digital textbook of all the college career options, or a college or a textbook on history? You don't have to work on this stuff alone, but these are really, really neat options, and again, they are free. And let me show you guys what an iBook looks like. Open up my iBooks here. So here's a book that somebody made up on the civil rights. Okay, pick your own cover. And these are all my different chapters. Chapter settings here. We can sift through and go for all of these different chapters. 
And let's say I want to open up this chapter. I click on here. I can have videos playing. And this is all done for free. This is all done for free on, on iBooks Locker. You guys can do it right here. This here is an interactive timeline. Oh, let's go back. So here's slide number two. Here's slide number three. Textbooks can't do this. And there's a lot of websites that you can find that already have some of this stuff made up. You just download it and, and embed it. They're you know, widget-based. But this stuff is amazing. Let's go to the next picture. If I click on some of these. video, and this is just running YouTube. It's just basically embedding a YouTube video into it. You can take a keynote presentation that you have that you've already made up, embed it into here. If you have information on pages or Word, two minutes or 20, okay. <laughs> so you can do all of these things on iBook Author, and again, free. Just come up with the ideas. Just start coming up with the ideas. There's a lot of things that you can do here. All the links are linkable. And if I click on the notes, I can create notes. I can hyperlink notes. I can create study cards. I've got a whole bunch of stuff that can happen on here. And your kids will love you for it. So lots of good stuff happening there. It is free. Going to go really fast to you, Demi. Udemy is great. Udemy is a free way for educators to publish their own work and publish work online for others to subscribe to it and also to learn from it. It's customized learning. I have an online course right now called iPads for Everyone. It's 22 videos. I'm not using this as a plug. But I took the idea of I just bought an iPad. I don't know what to do with it. And I popped it up here. And if anybody is interested in iPads, I'll give you the, the free codes for this stuff. But it's a way for you to publish your work. And all it is is screencast after screencast after screencast. And those are different ways that we can use audio and video. I know we're running out of time here. But let's really focus on the work. Now you have your website. You have your core. You have your audio that you put onto your website. You have your video that you put onto your website. You have your content that you have put onto your website. What's missing? Well, the students are missing. Share your students' work. We're going to talk right now about ways for your students to do 21st century learning. I had a student come up to me all really, really bummed out on a Monday. She says, I didn't do anything on Sunday but do this poster project. I spent all day cutting out and pasting and doing all these things. I said, what'd you get? She says, I got an A. I said, congratulations. And I said, what's going to happen next? And she says, well, my teacher's going to throw out the project. Or I'm going to throw out the project. Or it's going to, you know. What do you do with these things? Well, it's all about using digital media to create this digital interactive classroom for us. There's so many things here. This is why teachers get turned off by technology. It's overwhelming. How many of you guys here feel overwhelmed with all the technology that's out there? I certainly do. <coughs> Even with all this stuff going on, what do we want? Do we want social networking? Do we want video conferencing? Do we want anything like that? Why can't we just go back to the good old days? Just for a day. Just for a day. They're so happy to be here. And so we have this traditional education. Look around you. You're sitting in it right now. Two people per desk, maybe. Certainly, we can do something here. But students today are mobile. They're so dynamic. They're looking at colleges. They're looking at different tools. They're looking at social bookmarks. And they're looking at all these different things to keep them going. And so that brings up the slide here of, Mrs. Smith, if I wanted to tell you what I did for the summertime, you could just look at it on my Twitter feed. I'm already telling everybody what I did today. For instance, I knew exactly today when Bill got to school. How did I know that, Bill? I, I, what, what, what checked into me, though? I get in my car to come here, and I look at my phone, and there's a tweet. There's a tweet from Bill that says, Jeff's coming to school today. So it's a way to be interactive. It's a way to use this technology to show off the great stuff that you guys are doing. This is nice. This is nice, but I think we can do better. <clears throat> this is five years ago's idea of being nice. <laughs> Present it without comments, right? You have all this paperwork. You have all the, I know, look, if you went to my desk right now, you'd see it looks almost as bad because it's got instruments on it as well. So 
your desk probably looks something a little bit like this. How do we get rid of all this mess? How do we get rid of the, I, the hours and hours of grading stuff on the weekends? How many of you guys would like to free yourself of clutter on the Saturday night? Well, I'm going to show this to you. I've got, I'm running out of time. But the idea is I want you to watch this briefly. So you get the idea. Made um on what video? What was that? I said what what video was that? That was just a YouTube video. Oh. So I, I just I downloaded it. So usually what I do is we show this video. And now through a program called Poll Everywhere, which is polleverywhere.com. And if you're sitting, I know we're running out of time, but if you want to sit here, you can go to pollev.com slash teachercast. And you can actually interact with this. So the question is, what's your favorite cat video? Which one did you like? Now, I could test, pass out paper, and we could do a quiz on it, and I could collect the paper, or we can do this interactively. If you have a phone, it allows you to text message this number to this number. But let's see, who's going to be the first one to hit this one? And, and really quickly, pollev.com forward slash teachercast. Now, it doesn't matter if you're on a phone, on a desktop, on a Mac, on a Dell, on a piece, anything like that. If your kids are on that website right now, this will show up, and your kids can answer the question. If it's a yes or no question, they can interact with it. It's automatic feedback. We always do this check for understanding thing, right? This is simple and simple, easy feedback. See? Now, of course, the questions that come up with the educators are, well, what happens if you have a one person in your class and they decide to, well, you don't have to ask open-ended questions. You can ask yes or no questions, or multiple choice, A, B, C, D. So, neat idea, right? Be interactive. Be completely transparent and interactive. Okay? So, one of the great things that we can do here is change our classrooms. We have back channeling, content curation, voice communication, projects, website tools, group collaborations, video collaborations. And if I had another hour, we would go into all of that stuff. And I would be more than happy to talk about it during lunchtime or on Twitter or anything. We're running out of time, aren't we? Seven minutes. Can we do the marathon, folks? Back channeling. How many of you heard of the term back channeling? Back channeling is basically getting a group of people to make one common set of notes. We're going to talk a lot about back channeling. Later. Back channeling usually, like right now, we have, everybody's on their own device, we're going through it. Back channeling through a site like Today's Meet allows everybody in the classroom to take notes. The best part about taking notes on a classroom like this is that everybody sees what everyone's writing. And if you look down here, it says transcript. You can actually take this transcript of all this back channel and embed it onto your website. So let's say you're doing that lesson on Napoleon. Your kids could be finding blogs, podcasts, wikis, you name it, links, pictures, everything, posting them on here, and then at the end of the day, your class website can have a transcript of all of that stuff for the kids to learn from. Lots and lots of stuff. We talked about digital creation. Symbolu is a great idea and a great way for, for digital communication. It's basically c collecting the internet. Symbolu is, a, is a, a list of all of these different squares. You can Organize them however you want. This happens to be one of the teacher cast boards. I put some neat elementary stuff over here. I put some teacher cast resources over here. The best part about Symbol I find is that you can take that board and embed it onto your website. So you're not telling the kids to go to Symbol, you're telling the kids to go to your website to find the information. You can make one of these for every single chapter, subject. This can be links to movies, to pictures, to you name it. It's all right here. Digital posters. Let's go back. My student makes this poster and says, my teacher's going to throw it out. I just spent hours doing it. Well, no more. 
There is a website called S'more, S-M-O-R-E dot com. Has nothing to do with graham crackers and chocolate. It's digital poster boards. Through S'more, you can create flyers, poster boards, all of these different things. Your kids can make them up. Here's the, here's the book review of Huck Finn. Everything is here. Now, what do you notice about this? 250 views, 500 views. Now your student's work is being seen by other people. Now your students are realizing that there's no walls in your classroom. The neat part about that, again, you make your flyer. You can share it on Facebook. You can tweet it out. Right here is the word embed. You can have your kids make these, and then you can embed all of your kids' work on your website. Now you have your kids go back to your website and see all the work that they've done, that everybody else has done. And who else can see it? Grandma, right? People who are assessing you. And you can go to your, you can go to Bill and say, hey, look, guess what my kids are doing? It's all right here. Really, really neat stuff. Spoken communication. There is a free, free, free website called SpeakPipe. It allows a user to create a voice mailbox, a free voice mailbox. This is how all of our all of us podcasters do a like call in or to the hotline kind of a thing. So if you go to teachercast.net slash voicemail, it takes you to my SpeakPipe account. It's a free voicemail. Somebody comes into this website or my website, they can leave up to a 90-second message. Hey, I love your podcast. Hey, Mr. Brown, I didn't understand this thing about social studies. Can you explain it? You can get an email. And you can then write back to them, or you can record a voice message back and forth. And the best part about it for educators is that all that stuff is saved. It's very, very transparent. You have a whole list of your stuff here. I'm going to go really quickly. Virtual reality. We use a thing called Vokey, which is basically making your own avatar. Okay. You tell it what you want. You can pop, also put that up on the website. Video media. YouTube.com slash editor. You can take any YouTube video that has Creative Commons license and edit it down. Just like I showed you with the screencasting, just like I showed you with the iMovie, you can take all of these YouTube videos, not even the ones that you made, all of them, the NASA ones, the government ones, and instead of watching all 10 minutes, you can splice things together and make your own free. YouTube.com slash editor. And that is how you create a digital classroom. Later on today, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about KidsLog, why I think it's important. All of my kids right now are on KidsLog. They all have their own free blogging. I'll talk a little bit about passwords like we talked about earlier. And again, it's WordPress. KidsLog is done on WordPress. KidsLog also right now has 1.6 million users. It's huge. And it was done by educators. So in closing, now that we know how to make a website, now that we know how to create meaningful content, now that we've talked a little bit about some of the things that your students can do, there's only really one more thing to do. And that is really take all of these resources here and share your kids' work. Be proud of the work that you're doing in the classroom. Be proud of the work that your students are doing. Share the great stuff that's going on in your class, in your school. Another one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes. He said, it's not about selling computers. It's about enriching lives. And I have to take that, and I have to say, it's not about using this technology. It's about enhancing the learning experience. Now, maybe if the last 90 minutes has changed the, what is your definition of technology? Has anybody changed the definition of what is technology? I hope so. Now, I have one more assignment for you. If you go to teachercast.net, this is the last slide, teachercast.net slash 21st century classroom. Two one ST century classroom. We're going to see that I have created a page for you. It has the slide presentation from today. 
that you can thumb through. You can even embed onto your own website, and it has links to everything that we've talked about today. And more. Again, just very quickly, I greatly appreciate Jeff uh, and his time this morning. Uh, I think, as we all acknowledged at the beginning, you know, one of the toughest things about what we are trying to do is how overwhelming it can be. And one of the pictures that I think um, really represents that the most is that, for us, technology is like standing in front of an open fire hydrant. In regards. To